Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the uh, session on the uh, enhancing the digital divide uh, for the development of the uh, digitalization in the region. Uh, my name is Daisuke Hayashi uh, from the World Bank, and I'm a moderator of this session. And uh, once again, thank you very much for coming. And uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, in, uh, start with my uh, my presentation a bit uh, short, a brief, uh, so that uh, I would like to share with all of you that what is the background and what we are going to discuss about. And uh, this, okay. And uh, today's speaker is uh, composed of the fi uh, five people or from the government of Indonesia, ASEAN Secretariat, and Japan. Uh, those three are from uh, 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 speak uh, online. And the two tech specialists uh, from JICA, uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, Mr. Yamanaka-san uh, on, on your right and uh, from the Japanese uh, commerce uh, company, Merukari, uh, Mr. Amano-san will join us uh, as well. And uh, just to say that some uh, the background of the digitalization is not so uh, very familiar with all of you, so just uh, skip the uh, you know just uh, the details. But uh, we all share that you know the digital economy has a lot of you know potentials, and grows faster than the traditional economy. And uh, of course, you know they has generated considerable benefits like. Uh, 10% increase in internet adoption with the 0.5 to 1.2% income growth, or the 1% increase in adoption of digital technology is associated with labor productivity growth of 1 to 2.0%. There are so many examples, but uh, you know we can uh, already uh, know that uh, that kind of uh, potentials. And uh, also the on your right side, and uh, of course the uh, digital economy size is still modest, but uh, increasing rapidly and now between five to seven percent of GDP. And uh, notably in the EAP areas like the Indonesia has a lot of you know, uh, increase in recent years. And uh, but at the same time, we are facing the some challenges. Of course, you know, not only the digital uh, divide, but also the digital, uh, you know, the the leaders and lack of the digital leaders uh, of the in the region. For example, in the United States, of course, the you know the what do we call the GAFA. Uh, plus, um, uh, Microsoft has a lot of, you know, put, uh, kind of dominating the uh, the market, and also the Asia and the Pacific region. Do you, you see that uh, so many uh, companies are growing, but uh, compared to the United States and uh, United States, it's not so big, and of course, and the increasing the companies in the EAP region is so uh, rapidly like. Uh, do you you know, uh, for example, oh the C, uh, Tokopedia, Glove, or some sort of you know the apps like uh, uh, like uh, how can I say uh, the uh, the car uh, ride sh sharing system or e-commerce services are growing, but it's not so huge as the you know Google or other you know gigatech companies. So I think uh, we think that you know this kind of you know uh, the differences or lack of the you know or kind of not so much you know the growth of the the companies uh, are due to that lack of the knowledge, lack of the skilled people, or other things. So I like to uh, deepen this discussion, uh, uh, deepen those kind of perspectives, uh, so that how we evolve, how, how we could evolve the digital development in the region in the context of the digital skilled people, and this is a main point of the discussion. But of course, uh, I'd be happy to, of course, in, uh, the elaborate other uh, aspects as well. So uh, I'd like to uh, invite the, the ASIC, uh, Dr. Lan, 
to by of course an uh, introduction and as well as the regional uh, access uh, sharing the regional situation of digitalization and uh, what the challenges they are uh, facing so ransan please thank you thank you so very much i hope that you can hear me okay yes okay all right. I uh, very quickly to to share on the screen um, my uh, presentations. Uh, first, first of all, I would like to to thank the organizer World Bank and Hayashi San for the opportunity for me and my colleague uh, uh, Diane from the uh, Indonesian, the chair of the ASEAN, uh, this year to uh, update and and share our perspective on how ASEAN. Uh, moving forward the digital agenda now first i, I just want to uh, quickly uh, give you an overview that asean is very much aware of uh, immense potential uh, of the create of uh, the uh, a single digital economy for for of the regions uh, asean is now uh, the, the, the fifth largest economy in the world with 3000 3, billion us dollars and with uh, significant uh, 300 million uh, consumers uh, across the region. Now, the pandemic, the pandemic given a lot of, of, uh, of uh, impact on the economy, but it's actually a, a good accelerator for the digital transformation in, in ASEAN. And actually, you, you may see on, on, the, on the screen that there are more than, um, uh, 400 million of of, uh, of uh, people actually 460 million people are very much connected to the uh, internet and uh, and over the last uh, two years there are more than 100 new internet users actually join the uh, the internet uh, uh, setting so uh, having said that um, ASEAN is ready to embrace the digital transformation as a new uh, driver for for growth, and I, I, as you uh, may be aware, of that uh, last year ASEAN has launched the uh, ASEAN Digital Economy Framework Agreement, or in short, DEFA, and it estimated that uh, the DEFA agreement would further accelerate the digital uh, transformation of ASEAN, and and and. Uh, and uh, and and estimate that it, it is estimated that uh, the DEFA would contribute up to two trillion US dollar to the region uh, to the regional GDP. So the DEFA uh, mostly shed a new light for the ASEAN digital economy agenda in ASEAN, and uh, there are. Uh, there are a, a comprehensive nine key elements of the future ASEAN uh, DEFA that I would like to share with you, like uh, digital trade, uh, e-commerce, uh, digital ID and authentication, the online uh, and cybersecurity, the digital payment, the cross borders, um, uh, data flow, the uh, competition policy and, and cooperation for the emerging uh, topic and also the talent mobility. So um, now, uh, but having said that, I, I must uh, want to, to say that the journey of the ASEAN toward the digital transformation is not without uh, challenging. In fact, we have a lot of challenge that we need to overcome uh, in order to really uh, move forward the digital uh, economy agenda. First and foremost, that uh, ASEAN is a, a collective, is, is a, a collection of, of of a country with a very uh, different level of uh, readiness or digital readiness and, and level of development. And, uh, and uh, while we are sharing the same uh, uh, objective, we acknowledge that uh, within and among ASEAN, uh, we are, uh, some of the ASEAN member countries are actually in the, the top performer, are actually the top performers of the digital transformation while other country are very much uh, uh, at the lowest uh, performance in uh, in the in the region, and uh, and you you can see on the screen that uh, there is a, a, a quite uh, um, significant gap uh, 
uh, between the lowest and the high uh, and, and the top uh, performance within the ASEAN in terms of trade payment, digital payment, digital ID, cybersecurity. So that actually is an inherent disadvantage that ASEAN need to overcome in order to realize the so-called ASEAN digital economy. Um, now, um, another challenge that ASEAN need to do uh, to, to deal with, which is quite significant, is about the uh, cybersecurity and the gap remain in the establishment of, the, of a coherent legal framework for cybersecurity is very large. And uh, the level of maturity among ASEAN is still very significant. The digital, the digital divide, not only between ASEAN member country, but, but between or among the players within the ASEAN digital is also very large between micro, a small and medium size, and also a big, uh, big uh, company. So uh, as you may see on the screen that the micro and small enterprise is far below in terms of digital readiness to adopt in, in order to, uh, to fully benefit the digital transformation of ASEAN. And we, uh, we also, we, we acknowledge that there, there is an emerging challenge uh, with regard to the uh, emerging technology like AI, uh, like uh, 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 cloud computing uh, technology, in fact, it creates a lot of impact on our labor uh, market, on a, on a uh, on on a bias and 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 fairness of the uh, of the market. So we need to address it to ensure that uh, the environment, the the uh, the digital environment, is truly sound and and favorable to everyone. Last but not least, it is about the digital skill, and 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 according to the estimation that. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent of our, our of the job will be displaced by the digital technology uh, in the next few uh, few years. So uh, there are about 28.1 million of jobs will be uh, dis displaced by the digital technology. But at the same time, we are dealing with a lot of scarcity in terms of digital talent. So the uh, as you may see on the screen that. Um, uh, ASEAN need uh, uh, about 50 million additional digital professionals in this area, and we need to address, address it as soon sooner than later. So this is, there are two, two challenges that we need to, uh, to overcome. First, we make those who are unskilled to be more relevant. And, and we also need to train uh, a higher professional to uh, to actually to uh, to empower ASEAN to better, to really benefit the digital transformation. Now, I just want to turn to the my last point is that ASEAN is aware of our uh, our challenges. Uh, our challenges. We know that we need to do a lot, particularly in terms of digital skill, and 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 across the the sector body of ASEAN, like ASEAN SME, ASEAN uh, Science and Technology, ASEAN and Education. We all set up a facility to ensure that we have we open more opportunity for those who need uh, to uh, equip with uh, digital knowledge. While at the same time, we want to uh, uh, support the uh, uh, education system and the science technology in ASEAN to uh, to uh, really uh, uh, make ASEAN to be more adaptive to the new environment. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, I, I just want to stop here and, and to open for further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ran Sam. Uh, thank you for your comprehensive explanation. And uh, of course, we uh, now we understand that what uh, the challenges we are facing uh, uh, as a ASEAN whole. So I'd like to now invite the Indonesia, uh, Ms. Lan San, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Dian San for uh, sharing with us the, your uh, priority. Notably, you know, the Indonesia has experience in uh, the presidency of the G20 and ASEAN uh, last year and this year. So would you please share with us what are your priorities and uh, what kind of backgrounds as well? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Hayasi. So thank you also for the opportunity to speak in this prestigious panel discussion that you convened today. And uh, as you say that 
this year, Indonesia is no longer the presidency of G20, but we are part of Troika countries in the Digital Economy Working Group or DEWG 2023, uh, as well as the chair of ASEAN in 2023. At the same time, we um, actively uh, contribute to the Booth Forum and our ministry, the Ministry of Communication and Informatics of the Republic Indonesia, or MCIRI, involved and carried on priority deliverables in Booth Fora. As Troika in DEWG, Indonesia supports the three priorities of DEWG 2023 proposed by India's presidency. They are digital infrastructure for digital inclusion and innovation, building safety, security, resilience, and trust in digital economy, and digital skilling for building a global future-ready workforce. The last priority, the digital skilling for building a global future-ready workforce aims to enhance the G20 members' collective efforts to promote digital skill and digital literacy. With a focus on addressing digital divide and skill gaps, including gender skill gaps, through skilling, reskilling, and upskilling, and other capacity building initiatives. This digital skill initiative is a continuous effort made by the China in 2016, Germany in 2017, Argentina in 2018, and Indonesia G20 presidencies in 2022. Uh, during Indonesia's DEWG presidency 2022, we emphasize on digital skills and launch uh, three output documents. We launched a compendium of framework of practices and policies on advanced digital skill and digital literacy. And then G20 toolkit for measuring digital skills and digital literacy, and together with a collection of policies and recommendations to improve meaningful participation of people in vulnerable situations in the digital economy. Uh, moreover, as the chair of ASEAN 2023, MCI Indonesia oversees the digital sector under ASEAN Economic Community Pillar and Information Sector under ASEAN Sociocultural Community Pillar. Therefore, we propose three priority deliverables. Under the digital sector, we propose two priority deliverables. The first one, is regulatory pilot space to facilitate cross-border digital data flow to enable self-driving car in ASEAN, or we call it ASEAN RPS. The ASEAN RPS is uh, supported by uh, government of Japan as, um, as one of the uh, dialogue partner of ASEAN. And the second one is ASEAN Framework on Logistic for Digital Economy Supply Chain in Rural Area. And, and the last one, if you can see on the screen, we propose the guideline uh, development on management of government information for combating fake news and disinformation in the media. The document has just uh, launched in a uh, summary AMRI, it is a ministerial level meeting for information sector in Da Nang, Vietnam last month. And the key priority of the guideline is not only to improve digital literacy among ASEAN communities, but also ASEAN member state could focus on strategic communication, education, awareness and advocacy programs to combat fake news and disinformation. This, um, we will provide the soft copy of this uh, guideline online and can be accessible for everyone after we, uh, after some sort of time, maybe just this month, we will launch it uh, for public. For pu and then um, in our findings, that government information is managed properly 
and accordingly is believed to serve as one of the solution to counter and deal with disinformation and fake news circulation within the community. Therefore, Indonesia proposed this guideline to combating fake news and disinformation in the media, mainly to raise the ASEAN community digital literacy and uh, information literacy level. So this program is not only uh, aim what I mentioned before, but also to increase knowledge, promote behavior changes, build support, and influence policy decision. We uh, during the development of this framework, we uh, the guidelines. Sorry, I mean uh, we engage the fast fact fact checking network, interagency coordination, and cross functional collaboration. The collaboration are essential for achieving common goals in managing information to combat fake news and disinformation. And uh, this is one of our priority in ASEAN chairmanship that's already been done by uh, Indonesia. The two others is still ongoing. And um, I would like to say more on the Indonesia presidency during G20, especially in DWG in 2023 and during the ASEAN chairmanship in 2023, we demonstrated a strong commitment to advancing digital skill and technological development in the region. And under its leadership, Indonesia aimed to harness the power of digital transformation as a driver of economic growth and social development. The Indonesia government implemented various initiatives to foster digital literacy innovation and entrepreneurship. We actively promoted digital skill development to educational program, vocational training, and partnership with the uh, public and private sector. And then by prioritizing the digital skill, Indonesia sought to bridge the digital divide and answer that its people, as well as the broader Southeast ASEAN community, are prepared to thrive in the digital era contributing to economic prosperity and social inclusion on a global scale. Thank you, Mr. Ayasi. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dian Sam, for your uh, very uh, continuous work uh, between uh, from the G20 to ASEAN and uh, to concretize and, of course, in the, uh, deliver the, some more uh, uh, projects in the region. So. Now let's go and move to the uh, bit uh, different uh, bi uh, perspective, and uh, because uh, I uh, recognize that this year is the Japan uh, and ASEAN has uh, 50 years friendship year, and I think the Japan has been contributed to the region as well. So I'd like to invite the uh, Tsunoda-san uh, from the Ministry of Communications of Japan for sharing with us uh, some your priorities uh, and uh, your contribution to the region. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the question. I'm Rika Tsunoda from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. And I work mostly on promoting digital infrastructure globally uh, in International Digital Infrastructure Promotion Division. So this session is really relevant. So I think I'm so delighted to join this session. And for, as the Hayashi-san mentioned, uh, Japan hosted the G7 um, this year as a presidency. And I'd like to today share the priority of digital development with develop developing countries. And I think the first priority of Japan is to ensure economic resilience and economic security, um, including in developing countries in Indo-Pacific region. So to that end, promoting to deploy open and resilient digital infrastructure in developing countries is indispensable. So first, I'd like to reflect on the G7 in Hiroshima summit, uh, which Japan hosted as a presidency. And I'd like to focus on uh, free and open in the Pacific and economic resilience and economic security part. And in Hiroshima summit, G7 member states reiterated the importance of a free and open in the Pacific and underscored its commitment to strengthen uh, coordination with regional partners, including ASEAN and its member states, and also reaffirm the partnership with Pacific Island countries. And when we 
look at G7 leaders' statement on economic resilience and economic security. Uh, in building a resilient critical infrastructure part, it emphasized the importance of cooperating on enhancing security and resiliency in critical infrastructure in digital domain. And also we welcome the supplier diversification efforts on 5G operant architecture. So from that point, the Japanese government has been promoting open 5G architecture and vendor diversification in radio access network. So multiple approaches, including intergovernmental dialogue and government and industry collaboration, including capacity building. So Open Run is a radio access network that encouraged multiple vendors to share 5G networks through the open interface. And as you know, currently 5G serves as a basic infrastructure for our social and economic activities. So 5G uh, should be developed in secure, open, and robust way through competition by multiple vendors. And the uh, 5G operant architecture have some benefits like ensuring supply chain resilience by making telecom operators procurement more flexible and helping increase network transparency and also uh, promoting competition of base station market. So with regard to um, develop, digital development with developing countries in 5G open land, uh, in Quad leaders meeting this year, um, that Quad leaders statement announced cooperation with Palau one of the Pacific Island countries to establish a deployment of Operan so that regional countries are not left behind as telecommunication markets. And also there are government industry engagement cases to enhance knowledge of 5G Operan. For example, USAID launched Asia Operan Academy in Philippines, which is the human resource development program targeting in the Pacific region to enhance knowledge of Operan. And we call it AULA, and Aura has partnership with government, business, and civil society, including Japanese telecom companies. And so the MRC is also willing to cooperate with Aura with USAID. And next example is that um, this year marks 50th year of ASEAN Japan friendship and cooperation. And Japan will be holding a symposium on Open Land on November 1st and 2nd by using the ASEAN Japan ICT Fund, which was established by Japanese contributions. Uh, in the symposium, we are going to hold panels to share private companies' open and promotion efforts and digitalization by 5G networks. And also, uh, second priority is that I'd like to highlight the bearing the knowledge gap in digital skills and digital literacy as well as developing network is also high priority. And uh, because internet is borderless, so one country is having high technologies, knowledge isn't enough to achieve digital inclusion in the free and open in the Pacific. And to fill the knowledge gap, the government of Japan has been enhancing capacities in digital field, not only 5G in 5G earlier, as I mentioned, but also in other telecom areas. So I'd like to share the Japanese government activities. Uh, I'd like to quickly share my slide, okay. Um, yes, here we go. Uh, yeah, I hope you see my slide as well. And uh, okay. So um, this is the capacity building programs to API. And uh, the fund provides extra budgetary contribution to API and to support ICT training and international collaborative research and private project. And ICT training programs are targeted for officials from APT member states and provide lectures by experts and have discussions on broadband and cybersecurity. And also there are official visits to ICT companies. For example, in 2022, the Japan Telecommunications Engineering and Consulting Service, JTEC, provided a trip training program in Fiji for monitoring natural disasters and climate change by wireless network. And also there are international collaborative researches and projects, including internet quality assurance and security, and also development of an app. And in terms of cybersecurity, Japanese NICT, National Cybersecurity Training Center, develops training programs to deal with cyber attacks, such as cyber defense exercise. This. And the government, the Japanese government has been working on human resource development in cybersecurity field in cooperation with private operators in Asia Pacific region. 
For example, uh, this is the uh, ASEAN Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center, and we call it uh, AJCCBC. And uh, this, um, it was established based on the agreement of seven tiers ASEAN and Japan Telecommunications and Information Technology Ministers meeting in 2017. And it started its operation in Bangkok in September 2018. So AJCCBC has helped uplift cybersecurity capabilities in ASEAN region. Uh, so the main activity includes uh, conducting multiple cybersecurity exercises with private sectors, including CIDR, Cyber Defense Exercise Recurrence, and also uh, digital forensic exercise and malware analysis exercise. And also the AJCCBC holds annual competition of cyber attack called ASEAN Youth Cybersecurity Technical Challenge, or we call it Cyber Sea Game, to promote the ability of young engineers and students selected from ASEAN member states. And as of April 2023, AJCCBC holds approximately 1,200 participants in total and contribute to improving cybersecurity capabilities in the Asia Pacific region. So I'll stop here and thank you for listening. Uh, hi, Tosan. Thank you very much for your uh, explanation. Very, very uh, pr uh, fruitful and, uh, of course, comprehensive for uh, in terms of Japanese comp contribution. And now uh, I'd like to invite to the JICA Yamanaka-san uh, for uh, to ask you about the, some uh, your contribution as well as uh, because the JICA is has been uh, contributing a lot, not only uh, supporting uh, the the infrastructure building, but also the capacity building as well. So. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask you what uh, you uh, brought uh, to the kind of region, and uh, also uh, I think you have a lot of you know lessons learned from your experiences. So, uh, in terms of the digital scaling up uh, project, so I'd like to ask you for these questions. Thank you so much, Hayasan, and uh, thank you so much for our bank to organize this session. It's very, very interesting for us as well, uh, because ASEAN uh, or Asia Pacific um, region is actually a priority country for us as well. Um, in terms of actually, <coughs> um, just before I go, I think uh, just just to say who we are, I think is very important to to talk about. Um, we are like bilateral organizations, the donor organizations from Japan, Japanese government. And we currently, the last fiscal year, we had about 1,700 projects, ongoing project, with one point. Um, it's very difficult to say because Japanese yen is weakening, <laughs> but uh, fiscal year two in 2022, um, we had about 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion dollars of funding for, for the projects. And then last, uh, last year's, we actually had 13,217 actually um, <coughs> trainees actually trained. So in that respect, uh, as Hayashi uh, mentioned, we are doing a lot in terms of the capacity buildings uh, areas as well. And we also have like 9,163 experts and then JICA volunteers fielded all over the world. So in that also respect that uh, we actually uh, working in the more than 150 countries and ASEAN and as well as Asia Pacific regions. Pacific region is also the region where we work very closely. So in terms of actually <coughs> infrastructure development. Um, we have been doing quite a lot in the past, um, but currently in the digital technology per se, um, we are not uh, really doing a lot in the Asian Pacific regions. Rather, we actually use it utilizing the infrastructure that we have contributed to support and then trying to actually have the digital components into it. Except maybe uh, we are doing the projects such as like uh, um, electro geospatial, electrical, uh, reference points uh, that we're doing this project in Thailand. That's a very important point where it's going to actually help, for example, mobile-based services because reference point is very important for the mobility service to use, such as like automated sort of like uh, you know automated mob you know uh, like cars and so on, or uh, even like uh, automated uh, you know combines. You know where the field where they actually they actually do the the field work, work or automatically. So we're doing a lot of POCs based on these um, reference points that we're helping them. Apart from that, uh, we're using, uh, we, s we have supported quite many actual infrastructure development in like water, uh, roads, um, other areas. 
and where we see a lot of actually digital uh, technology needs. So we're actually trying to incorporate a lot of digital technologies as well as incorporating how can you use the data uh, to, to support these initiatives as well. So that's what we're doing. And in the previous panels, actually, we have been mentioned quite a lot in terms of cyber capacity buildings. Um, we actually, um, and then I think uh, Director Tsunoda was mentioning about uh, AJ, it's, uh, AJCCBC, in the Asia Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Centers. Uh, we are actually utilizing centers, cooperating with the centers to provide different, actually, capacity building initiatives in ASEAN regions. And then we are trying to ex expand that centers to be a center of excellence on creating the cybersecurity human resources. So that is something that we're doing very closely. Um, as well as other sort of technical assistance project or initiatives in the ASEAN, specifically in the ASEAN regions, uh, in terms of uh, cyber securities. Um, Hayashisa, if you don't stop me, I, I'm going to continue. <laughs> so, um, in terms of actually a significant, for, for example, Pacific Island initiatives, uh, we are uh, currently in talks uh, with um, you know, our partners like United States and, uh, and Australia to actually have a um, fiber lines actually uh, to be built to the new way. Uh, it's another sort of alternative route, routings for the, um, you know, the, the critical sort of fiber backbone. So that's what we are doing. Um, so in short, not short, I guess, <laughs> we, we have been doing a lot in terms of, uh, you know, capacity buildings right now, um, specifically utilizing a lot of support that we have done in the infrastructures in other regions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your sharing your experiences. And now uh, I'd like to invite the 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 uh, Mr. Uh, Amano from the Mercari company uh, to share with a uh, different uh, perspectives of the digital skills. And because I think uh, the kind of in Japan and also the ASEAN, you know, contribution is a uh, you know not mainly, but uh, you know, uh, principally on the kind of public sector's point of view. So. I think uh, not only the public sector, but also private sectors, you know, the skilling up is so important to be innovative in the region or kind of globally speaking. So uh, I'd like to ask you, Amano-san, to share your experiences and uh, how you contributed to the kind of, I think Mercari has a lot of experience to support uh, the scaling up the digital uh, skilled people in the local areas in Japan. So I'd like to ask you about that. Thank you. Uh, just thank for thank Hayashi-san for the invitation to this invaluable opportunity and the other participants for the fruitful discussion and the information sharing. I'm from the private sector. Uh, I mean, uh, working for Mercari Inc. We Mercari provide the smartphone application named Mercari, the same to company name, which is a peer-to-peer -peer trade platform of the second-hand items and handmade items. Uh, by reducing the disposal of items by individual trades, we aim to accelerate the circular economy into the society with our apps. Now, we Mercari have broadened our business, not only Japan, toward the US, and ready to promote the further expansion in the world. In Japan, we have more than 20 million customers, reaching 100 billion yen in the GMB last year, I mean, the gross market value. Now, uh, we, Mercari, support the local students by giving a project-based learning program and donation to a local tec uh, technological college, Kamiyama Kosen, using uh, our Mercari app. Through our PBL program, high school students sell local products on our Mercari site, which it is very difficult for undigitized local companies or traditional industry we had a program in Wakayama, Kyoto, so on. There, we teach digital skills as well as digital marketing skills, including data analysis, to the local students. And based on needs, they sell the local food and traditional products in Kyoto in the real easy business. They are expected to acquire useful digital knowledge and experience in the real situation and the ability to survive and commerce in the difficult era. On the other hand, uh, the Kamiyama Tech College is an educational institution which gives IT education utilizing regional features such as agriculture and so on. 
Mecca gives the support in the form of donation and convention agreement. In particular, as the majority of Japanese engineers are male, we aim to increase the number of female engineers in the school. And uh, in that, we give the workshop for engineers and local people in the Kamiyama Kosen. Um, the, in this way, for the growth of engineers in the countryside, it is very useful to utilize the local resources, which facilitate the students utilize what they learned in the school in the real situation. Um, but the lesson that we learned from the kind of educational activities is a lack of human resources, which can give technological and real experience in the local areas. It is quite difficult. I mean, that the through internet, you can learn digital skills and how to use data analysis on YouTube, or etc. But the most important feature for younger generation is the kind of situations or kind of communication with real people. So by dispatching specialist engineers from Elkali to kind of the local local schools and the local company companies, we try to kind of um, not educate, but deepen the understanding of digital skills in the in the region. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Amano-san, for your sharing the your kind of very different uh, experiences that we had and a kind of public sector's point of view. And uh, I think, you know, from the Yamanaka-san's point, uh, the indication and the amano -san indication that, you know, uh, that we are focusing mainly, uh, we have been focused on mainly on the cyber security, you know, capacity building, and of course Japan could support it for a long time for these cyber security matters. And, but at the same time, we are not ignoring, but, uh, you know, we don't know how, what to do with uh, kind of more digital skilled people to be innovative, right? And the cybersecurity is a point of more, you know, pro uh, protective way uh, for the from the attack, uh, cyber attacks or something like that. But uh, I think the digital skill, you know, creation of the digital skill people is a more, uh, more positive uh, to be should be more positive way to do that. So. I think you know uh, that from the Lansan's uh, the presentation that uh, he uh, uh, I think uh, Lansan you, you made a presentation on the you know some sort of you know the sectors that you are going to do or can we ASEAN is uh, now focusing on so uh, would you please share with uh, your experience that a little bit more uh, what is the sectors do you think that most important or kind of more important to to be uh, skilled up and also how to uh, what is the best way to create the the ways uh, for the creating the people and this is the question for you thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, now in ASEAN, um, we very much focus on the inclusive participation uh, of the players in the digital economy. So the small, the micro, small, and medium size, the household uh, deserve to, to be equipped with uh, sufficient digital knowledge in order for them to actively and effectively participate in the future's digital economy of ASEAN. And that is our top priority for the digital era. And I'm thanked for a lot of support, including those in the private sector and in the donor, including Japan. The ASEAN has established a very uh, a proactive facility. Uh, we call it ASEAN uh, SME Academy which is an online platform to enable everyone, especially those who are small and medium size, can participate and enjoy uh, the uh, uh, upskilling, reskilling program. And the second thing that we also encourage the business to visit matching so that we can encourage more small and medium size household to participate in the future or in the, uh, the digital economy 
uh, uh, um, uh, of ASEAN. So uh, that is the first part of it. The second priority that ASEAN is very much focused is uh, we, we want to promote the cross-border, the cross-border uh, uh, e-commerce throughout the region. And that also enables a lot of good initiative, like how to promote the e-commerce the e transactions by having a better logistic system across the region. And the second, we need to develop the so-called the digital payment system throughout the region. And last year, we have secured uh, a good agreement among the member states of ASEAN to enhance the, the so-called uh, digital payment network using the QR code. So there are six member countries of ASEAN already a part of that network. And we want to do more so that the banking sector, the banking sector can, can actually collaborate with each other to enable a cross-border digital payment. And we are going to develop a new system where uh, a new system for the digital ID or digital business ID to enable the interoperable platform for uh, business and consumer who actually can confidently participate in a digital environment of ASEAN. Now, on top of that, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I uh, believe that ASEAN has a lot of, 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 of things to do uh, in order to, to train our people and to train unskilled worker to become more skilled in the digital environment. And then a lot of things we need to do, and we are happy to work closely with our donor, a partner, World Bank, Japan, and then in order to address the, uh, uh, the issue or the challenge in the digital skill uh, in the years to come. So for that, I, I stop here. Thank you very much. I thank you, Lan San, uh, for your sh uh, your thoughts and the very very comprehensive thoughts. Uh, yes, I think uh, you know the, the more and more uh, the digitalization is expanding, the kind of more and more uh, cross-sectoral uh, approach is more important. You know, like banking system, payment system, all the systems are to be composed of the many aspects, right? Not only cybersecurity, but also the how to involve the, you know banking sectors and also the taxation etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is very important that the many uh, actors or uh, should be involved in uh, for creating one system which means that the many aspects of the knowledge uh, should be Im uh, integrated uh, to create one or two systems so I think this kind of, you know, the integration of the knowledge is uh, key to to for the fundam fundament uh, foundation of the next year's uh, the innovation, digital innovation. Uh, so uh, let's go in forward to the, you know, the sector, uh, the the further uh, fu uh, for the futures, you know, uh, perspectives. And I'd like to uh, invite Dian san to uh, share with us what is uh, the law uh, expected to the public sector. I mean, the ASEAN's view, or the you know, of course, not only the the regional uh, c organization, but also the like the World Bank or other you know international or the multinational entities can do for uh, deepen this kind of, you know, knowledge uh, sharing uh, system. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Hayashi for the question. So I would like to address it um, in the role that Indonesia expect from the public sector and other multinational entities. Um, I would like to focus only on the uh, digital and information sector. That's uh, because that's uh, my area scope of work. So I will focus your to answer your question on that area. 
uh, in the age where digital information and technology are transforming societies, economies, and government, Indonesia, like many other nations, has high expectation for collaboration and support in this uh, re reality, in this uh, new reality for the development of technology and its rapid growth. So Indonesia, with its growing population and emerging economy, is believed to harness the potential of digital and information sector for the betterment of its society. However, to fully realize the opportunities and mitigate the challenges, the country looks to the public sector and multinational entities for cooperation and collaboration. Uh, of course, we are member of many international organizations, such as uh, International Telecommunication Union and then ASEAN, and we actively uh, engage with ASEAN and also the other uh, dialogues uh, partners, uh, which in also includes Japan, of course, in it, and the, we are actively engaging G20 and other in international, multilateral and international fora. There. But first and foremost, for Indonesia expect cooperation is in building a robust digital infrastructure. The reliable and high-speed internet connectivity is the backbone of any digital information. I think this is a promise of digital information, uh, digital transformation. And then uh, for the public sector, in collaboration with multinational entities, can support Indonesia expand and improve its digital infrastructure, ensuring that even remote areas have access to the internet. This is not only support economic growth, but also empower citizens with valuable information and resources. Indonesia also anticipates support in nurturing its burgeoning technology and startup ecosystem. The digital sector presents an opportunity to foster innovation, create jobs, and drive economic growth. Collaboration with international uh, technology companies and investors can help Indonesia startups gain access to capital, mentorship, and global markets, accelerating their development and contribution to the economy. Moreover, in e-governance, Indonesia expects public sector cooperation to play a pivotal role in digitizing government services. This can streamline administrative processes, reduce bureaucracy, and enhance transparency, making it easier for citizens to access essential services. A multinational, multinational entities can also provide expertise and technology to support the digitalization of government function. Next is about data privacy and cybersecurity. Both are critical concern in the digital age. So Indonesia has several cooperation with public sector and international organization in establishing robust data protection law and cybersecurity measure. Collaboration is essential to guard against cyber threat, safeguard sensitive information, and build trust in digital ecosystem. Additionally, Indonesia expects support in the education sector to equip its citizens with digital skills and literacy. In a world driven by technology, digital education is crucial to prepare the workforce in tomorrow's uh, public-private partnership can facilitate programs that train individuals in digital skills, ensuring that there are no one left behind in this space, uh, in this fast-paced digital revolution. Inclusivity is another vital aspect of Indonesia expectation from the public sector and multinational entities. The nation seeks to bridge the digital divide, ensuring that all citizens, regardless of their location and socioeconomic status, can benefit from the digital age. This may involve subsidizing access to digital services and ensuring that the content is available in local languages. As with many sector, Indonesia expects cooperation that respects its national sovereignty and values. We are the country with a very diverse cultural and entities, so we should acknowledge and preserve the digital space. In conclusion, 
Indonesia recognizes the transformative power of digital and information sector. The nation looks to the public sector, including its own government, as well as multinational entities to collaborate in building a digital infrastructure, nurturing innovation, improving government services, protecting data, fostering education, promoting inclusivity, and respecting cultural diversity. So uh, we can harness the potential of digital aids, which benefit uh, to all, not only uh, Indonesian, but also uh, contribute to the nation and regional growth and development. Thank you, Mr. Hayasi. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, just, uh, okay, we have five minutes left. So just uh, briefly asking the, uh, the Japan and the JICA for just uh, from your uh, views on the, uh, the how, how to promote these, you know, the, the the to promote uh, you know digitalization with uh, through the you know skilling up the digital uh the digital digitally skilled people right uh the increase the digital skilled people so maybe japan uh mic first just briefly please okay. just briefly um with my comments i think uh building on what hayashi san said and dr ran said um i think although there are already institutions and programs that have been providing capacity building such as apt asia pacific Terra community and uh, ajccbc and but i believe it's meaningful to provide variety of programs by multiple channels by multiple organizations including world bank um is very really meaningful because each country has different needs and we should meet their needs as much as we could. And with regard to the contents of the capacity building, as Hayashi-san said, I think not only in cybersecurity, but also ICT solutions and utilization services are important areas to focus on as Amanosa shared uh, Mary Kali in this session. And uh, MIC has been helping Japanese telecom companies which provide digital services to solve global issues such as climate change and inequality and expand its ICT solution services to overseas by using its budget. And as Dr. Lan said, um, there, the nature um, focus on, I think I'm focused on the cross-border payment and digital ID, there are also uh, the uh, Japanese ICT companies that, that have such kind of um, techniques, uh, technicals like cross border payment or digital ID. So through these capacity buildings, and I think the government of Japan could share these ICT solutions to developing countries in addition with digital infrastructure and developing countries could get to know these solutions. Because of my point. Thank okay. You. Thank you. And then Yamanaka san, please. Minute, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. Actually, so uh, building on to Tsunoda san's actually comment, I think. Uh, you know, uh, partnership with private sectors, I think that's going to be critical, I think. That's because they actually have the technological solutions, so they know it. So how can you actually support the, the connections between the companies like in ASEAN with the Japanese company? I think that's also going to be very, very critical. And in terms of content, not only in the digital skill side, but I think the policy is very important. So like, how can you actually have the countries actually have the right policies to support and foster, you know, innovations and the ecosystem development as well? So in that respect, that we also support the digital for the digital policies, actually skills trainings as well. So we need to actually have this double prone approach. Not only the technology skills are important, but you know the content of the policy areas, as well as the, uh, digital skills in terms of technology skills connecting with the private sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comprehensive and uh, very very <laughs> conclusive <laughs> comments. Uh, just finally ask uh, Amano san, invite uh, Amano san from your per, uh, private company uh, sector's point of view. I mean, uh, as Yamanaka san mentioned, uh, you know, the collaboration uh, with the private sector is so important and becoming more and more important from the now on to the innovation. So please uh, say some some you know, conclusion of words from you. Well, <laughs> it's quite difficult to say conclusion or what, but uh, I hope that uh, in order to implement digital skills to local or developing countries people, it is quite important not only educate digital skill, but also that communication with kind of top, top tier engineers uh, with local people. From this viewpoint, and the promotion of movement people from the urban side to local side is very important by the government but also lowering the barrier of the cross-border movement of engineers are quite, quite 
also very, very important because in, uh, in including Japan, uh, in, um, even in the developed country, we have a scarce of engineers and we also need the top tier engineer uh, in, even in the urban area, but also that the local area. So um, that the, we, pro, uh, we hope that the government try to uh, lowering the barrier kind of taxation or visa issuing. So for, for doing that, and that the digital skilled people will I mean that the kind of disperse over the world. I think that uh, this is quite important for implementing digital skills into the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amano san. Yeah, I think uh, from the, the session, this uh, this session, uh, I believe that you know uh, we understand what uh, we are facing, uh, the, the challenges we are facing, and uh, but at the same time, you know, we had a lot of experiences on the some some you know uh, dumb, uh, sectors like cyber sec sec uh, cyber securities and uh, you know infrastructure uh, technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So from now on, I think. You know, it's very important to kind of improve or develop or foster uh, the digitalization by creating a more uh, innovative people, uh, which means that uh, that a lot of skills and of course not is very uh, impressed uh, by the other sectors, you know, expertise and also the mixture of the this culture. So uh, I think uh, not it's a kind of private and the pri uh, public private, you know, the collaboration is very important. So I think uh, it's very important to create uh, some sort of the you know discussion uh, place or the venue uh, for uh, exchange and knowledge or kind of you know the ex uh, the, the exchange points uh, for 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 further uh, scaling up the digital uh, skills uh, from the region to the world and uh, uh, that's what uh, that's uh, that might be bringing the kind of in you know, a more exchange uh, globally and uh, not only the regionally or kind of country level but also the global you know exchange and that would uh, lead to the more uh, further uh, the innovation which leads to the you know AI or AI innovation that we are discussing mainly the in this IGF 2023 so uh, I'm sorry, but it's a uh, random time, and uh, so I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot take the uh, question from the floors, but uh, thank you very much for your collaboration, and I hope that, you know, uh, of course, fr from the World Bank side, I'd be happy to work with uh, all of you, uh, our clients, to develop the digitalization in the world, and of course, with the J Japanese, as well as the, the ASEAN, and uh, uh, private sectors, you know, collaboration. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation.